Ambitious cops who are really determined to put a dent into the crime rate and put some bad guys in jail often cultivate informants in order to do their job while other cops just punch the clock and wait for retirement. Informants with healthy relationship with cops sometimes push their limits and commit crimes believing themselves to be immune from arrest. One such situation occurred here in Montreal when an affable sociable criminal named James Medley developed a relationship with police officer Claude Aubin who was determined and intense and sought to clean up the streets of West End Montreal. Medley was an English-speaking black Montrealer from a broken home born in 1958. He never learned to read or write and couldn't even say where he was because of his inability to read the street signs, but he knew how to chatter. In one instance in 1989, he bent the ear of a newspaper columnist to defend a police officer who killed a black man, saying, Everybody where I worked was black, and he would come in and tell us if we didn't move our cars, he'd have to give us tickets. If he was racist, he wouldn't do that. This demonstrates that at this point, Medley probably already had a very healthy relationship with the police officers. Medley lived at 5225 Randall in NDG, not far from Walkley, which was known at the time as a hot spot for crack cocaine and violence. The rest of the story is told in an excellent manner by Montreal newspaper reporters from the time. Here's a 12 November 1997 article by Monique Baudin and Catherine Wilton, which I will read now. At first glance, James Medley's former home looks like all of the other rundown apartment buildings lining Randall Avenue and NDG. But step inside the musty lobby, climb the dirty staircase to apartment 4, and you'll find a clue above the rust-colored door that something sinister went on inside. Hastily applied plaster covers a hole where Medley had installed a surveillance camera. He used it to a monitor who approached the door because he wanted to ensure his abuse of runaway teenage girls remained a closely guarded secret. Yesterday, Medley was convicted of torturing and sexually assaulting four teenage girls, forcing two of them into prostitution and planning to kidnapped a fifth girl. All the girls were under youth protection between 1991 and 1996 when the crime were committed. Montreal police said it was one of the worst cases of sexual abuse they'd ever seen. A two-month Gazette investigation has found that Medley victimized at least 12 more girls in the same period, most of whom were also under youth protection. The girls were too afraid to press charges against Medley. The Gazette has traced Medley's life from the time he was abandoned as a baby in 1959 to the day he was arrested in October. October 1996 for confining a runaway girl in his apartment for 16 days. Medley refused to speak to the Gazette because the newspaper would not pay for an interview. But interviews with his foster parents, child care workers, teachers and psychiatrists paint a portrait of an emotionally disturbed man who has displayed an all-consuming need for power and control since his youth and had no qualms about using violence to achieve his goals. From an early age, Medley displayed a violent temper and behavioral problems. A Jekyll and Hyde-like personality, he'd switch in an instant from a friendly, outgoing teenager to a violent, uncontrollable monster that youth protection employees couldn't quite handle and were unable to help. After growing up under youth protection and spending nearly eight years in jail as an adult, Medley, 39, used his knowledge of both these systems to mastermind a sex slave ring that preyed on teenage girl under the state's care. A police informer who kept tabs on drug dealings in NDG, Medley enforced his victim's silence with threats, telling them the police were his friends and he'd kill the girls and their families if they talked. How James Medley went from being an abandoned toddler to a sadistic sexual predator is the story of an illiterate convict who outsmarted youth protection officials and the police for years until a routine search for a runaway led to a battered girl in his bedroom closet. A few days before Christmas 1993, a telephone rang in the detective's office at a police station in NDG. An edgy, fast-talking inmate was calling from the overcrowded Bordeaux prison, offering to help police solve a growing problem in the West End. James Medley, a longtime police informant, told the detective he could help get 14 and 15-year-old kids in NDG to give up their guns. But there was a catch. Medley, who had just begun a four-month sentence for beating an acquaintance with a baseball bat, wanted out of jail sooner. The detective drove to Bordeaux to meet Medley, a criminal with a reputation as a cunning manipulator. After negotiations with a smooth-talking 35-year-old, a deal was struck. A few days later, Medley was free. His motive for getting out of jail early had nothing to do with helping police. He wanted out so he could hunt down the 16-year-old girl he had tortured, raped, and forced into prostitution over the previous year. She had fled his apartment during the 15 days he was in jail, and he wanted her back. It didn't take Medley long to track down the girl at a seedy motel 
in St. James Street in Lower NDG, where she was staying with a friend. Medley called the motel manager, told him he was a bounty hunter, and threatened to kill him if he didn't kick the girl out immediately. The manager alerted the girl, who packed her clothes and took off in a taxi just as Medley stormed in. A few days later, Medley tracked down the girl and her male friend at a house they were hiding in on Girard Avenue in NDG. He called police and said the male friend, who had escaped from a minimum security jail, was there and was armed. As police broke down the door, Medley watched from outside, rel relishing his revenge. When the sobbing, hysterical girl came out, Medley offered to find a lawyer for her friend and took her back to his Cote St. Luke Road apartment. When they got there, the muscular six-foot Medley offered the girl a hug. She opened her arms, but he punched her in the stomach. Then he stripped her, tied her up, threw her in the bathtub, whipped her with a belt, and threatened her with a gun. The next day, he let her go. That taken care of, Medley knew it was time to keep up his end of the deal with the police. He sauntered into Station 15 in NDG, carrying a bag with three 9mm pistols, and handed it to the same detective he had called from Bordeaux. Although Medley told him he found the guns in certain places, the detective doubted they came from the street, as he had been promised. He suspected they came from Medley's own cash. His stories were a bit far-fetched, and I wasn't sure where the guns were coming from, the detective said. Maybe they were part of something he was involved with. He got his hands on them, and he wanted to keep me happy. The gun deal was vintage James Medley, a typical ploy that illustrates how the handsome, affable man with the intellectual capacity of a child, manipulated, used, and abused almost everyone he met. By the time he was arrested in October 1996, Medley's operation had escalated into a full-blown sex torture prostitution ring so heinous and degrading that police started to compare him to Paul Bernardo, the Ontario man convicted of the sex slayings of two teenagers in 1995. Medley's two-week trial, in fact, bore eerie similarities to Bernardo's, including the playing in the courtroom of a sex video of one of the victims. As well, Medley Medley's co-accused, Tracy Gonzalez, painted herself as a victim, as did Bernardo's ex-wife, Carla Homolka. But the only thing different is that none of the victims is dead, said, said Detective Lieutenant Michel Frechette of the MUC police. Like the teenage girls he terrorized, James William Medley knew the impersonal, detached world of state institutions firsthand. About 16 months after he was born in January 1958, Medley was abandoned by his mother and taken in by a foster family in Rosemount District. But Medley started displaying behavioral problems and was placed in the Douglas Hospital, a psychiatric institution in Verdun. He spent many years at the Douglas under pretty severe circumstances which were being used at psychiatric hospitals at the time, said a former teacher who remembered Medley as a fat, mute kid living at the hospital. If the kids misbehaved, they'd be squirted with a water gun. Despite his unhappy experiences at the Douglas, Medley returned to the hospital as an adult to seek help for hyperactivity, dyslexia, and impulsive personality problems. After living at the Douglas for five years, Medley was moved to the Weardale Boys Home an orphanage in Lower Westmount. When he was 12, he was sent to the Shawbridge Boys Farm, an English youth protection facility in the Laurentian town of Prevost. Everybody knew James Medley, recalled Bernard Laberge, who taught at Shawbridge and later represented Medley as a lawyer. He was very loud and exuberant and had very impulsive, fiery personality. It didn't take staff long to realize Medley would be a handful. He was placed in Burke's Cottage, the residence for the most disruptive boys. Former employees remember Medley as wild and unpredictable with a wicked temper that could erupt in an instant. He was like a tiny little boy in a large body and he was strong and physical so he would be calm in the way that a little boy might be calm but then go into a rage, recalled John Hatch, a child care worker who remembers Medley from his days at Shawbridge in the 1970s. A certain look would come across his face and he had strength beyond what you would expect a person of his size and age to possess. Although Shawbridge staff knew Medley's violent behavior could lead to problems. Hatch said they couldn't help him. Most of the people in charge of Medley were young university graduates in their first jobs who lacked the experience to deal with a James Medley. It was frustrating because none of us could ever do him any good, and we knew it, Hatch said. Medley should never have been placed at Shawbridge because he was a danger to himself and those around him, he said. It was negligence that put him there and kept him there, Hatch said. There have been dire consequences for many innocent people because someone like Jimmy never got the help that he damn well 
deserved. After four years at Shawbridge, Medley was placed in a group home with other Shawbridge boys in Montreal's Cote St. Paul district. When he moved into the home in 1974, his reputation preceded him and the boys were nervous about living with the strapping 16-year-old. Jimmy had a reputation before he came to us as being a strong and powerful figure and a lot of the kids were afraid, recalled the man who ran the group home with his wife. Yet Medley proved to be a welcome addition to the neighborhood around Church Street, babysitting for neighbors. He struck up a close relationship with a woman running the home. He even called her mom. She met more than 200 boys in group homes over a seven-year period and there was no doubt that Jim was her favorite. Trouble that Medley couldn't read or write. The couple spent many evenings trying to help him. They gave him a list of words to memorize on a Friday. By Monday, he had usually forgotten them. The man said he'll never forget the night he came home and found Medley sitting in a chair crying. He said, I know there's something wrong with me, but I don't know what it is. The man recalled, my wife worked with Jimmy and tried to help him understand that he did have a problem. The man said Medley often fretted about his future because his illiteracy was preventing him from holding part-time jobs. He needed help filling applications, but when he did get a job, he'd often quit because he couldn't read instructions. It was at this time that signs of his depraved sexual tastes surfaced. The woman who ran the group home found pornographic magazines in Medley's bedroom depicting bondage scenes. She talked to him and told him it wasn't a normal way to treat women. While Medley lived at the group home, he attended classes at John Grant High School in Lachine for students with learning disabilities. Teachers remember Medley as a charming, talkative, attention seeker who craved authority and skirted the edge of trouble. Like many illiterate people, Medley masked his deficiency by developing strong verbal skills. He could talk his way out of anything. Maurice Custy, his former gym teacher, said Medley's classmates elected him student council president and he led them on a walkout in solidarity with teachers who were on a province-wide strike in 1976. He told them they were on strike supporting the teachers, a former principal said. He had charisma. All the kids would follow him. But he also had a violent temper and once pulled a knife on me. He could change from smiling Jack to a vicious animal like that. More than 20 years after he left the school, several teachers still vividly remember Medley as a devious con man recalling how he once duped a Gazette reporter into writing an article painting him as an overachiever stuck in a school for slow learners. In the article published in 1976, Medley criticized his teachers saying he would report kids who needed help. It took teachers so long to give them attention. By that time they were all messed up. Medley also claimed he wasn't learning enough at John Grant so he took a night course in child psychiatry at McGill University to improve his chances of getting into college. I think that reporter just fell for it hook line and sinker cuss, he said. It just goes to show how good he was verbally. Medley's need to control others surfaced frequently. He helped Custy run her gym classes and sometimes tried to lead group therapy sessions, taking over from a guidance counselor. As long as he had quasi-leadership role, he was happy, the counselor said, but he didn't have the maturity to lead the group. Medley left John Grant in 1976, the same year that Shawbridge moved the boys to a different group home in Rosemount. The woman taking care of Medley persuaded Shawbridge staff to let him stay in the youth protection system past his 18th birthday because he couldn't take care of himself. She was worried about what was going to happen to Jim, her husband said. There was always a question about where he would go and what he would do. Medley was heartbroken at leaving the group home. To help ease his move, the woman running the home gave him the family dog, which Medley adored. She thought it was too much to take Jim away from her and the dog too, the woman's husband said. When he left, we missed him. He sort of grew on you. The couple's concern for Medley's well-being was well-founded. In 1977, at the age of 19, he committed a string of break-ins and armed robberies that landed him in jail for most of the next five years, criminal behavior that continued until the day of his arrest in October 1996. The man who ran the group home in Cote St. Paul believes Medley committed some of those crimes to ensure he had a place to stay after he left the youth protection system. He was out in the world with no one to look after him anymore, he said. When he was in jail, the decisions were made for him. He had a place to stay and food to eat. The last time the man and his wife saw Medley was a couple of years later while Medley was on parole from a jail in Cowansville. Medley showed up at their house with a friend who sat at the kitchen table and sliced matchbooks into shreds with a large knife. When Medley left their home that day, the couple were happy to see the end of him. My wife thought, who is he going to bring next time? By 1983, Medley, then 25, had exchanged his prison uniform for street clothes and moved back to his old stomping ground in Verdun near the Douglas Hospital and a few blocks away away from his old group home. That winter, he met a 30-year-old woman with a young daughter. They moved into an apartment together on First Avenue, but by spring, their relationship had soured and Medley moved out by April 1988.
1984. Two months later, the woman called the police after Medley attacked her while she was removing some of his belongings from their apartment. She testified in court that Medley held an axe over her head and threatened to kill her. Then he grabbed me, he threw me against the wall, I fell to the ground and he kicked me twice in the face, she told the judge. A few days later, Medley called the woman and threatened to burn down her apartment and take away the thing that was most precious to her. She took this to mean her daughter. Medley pleaded guilty to charges of assault and uttering death threats and was sentenced to three years in prison for those charges plus a series of break-ins and robberies in Verdun and Point St. Charles. Out of prison in 1986, Medley left his old neighborhood in Verdun and moved into a world of pimps, prostitutes, and drug dealers around Walkley Avenue in NDG. It was one of the seediest and most dangerous neighborhoods in Western Montreal and it was being torn apart by two rival gangs waging a turf war over the lucrative crack cocaine trade. It was at this time Medley hooked up with the first in a string of teenage girls on the run from group homes and other youth protection centers affiliated with Shawbridge. Medley, who was then 28, began harboring a 16-year-old girl he had met when both were patients at the Douglas Hospital. Police picked the girl up at Medley's place almost on a weekly basis. She went back to Shawbridge reluctantly, telling police officers she loved Medley and wanted to live with him. Once Medley and a friend went up to Shawbridge to help her escape, but they were undaunted, Medley and the girl turned to the police officers who had been tracking her down, Detective Sergeant Claude Aubin and his partner, and asked them to persuade youth protection authorities to let them live together. The two cops and Shawbridge's director of security agreed. Aubin accompanied the couple to juvenile court and wrote the judge a letter promising to keep an eye on the couple. James on his own was no good and she on her own was no good, Aubin said in a recent interview. If she stopped running away and he settled down, they could be a good couple instead of having two losers. Over the next few years, Aubin and Medley developed a father-son relationship. Aubin found furniture for the couple, helped Medley get odd jobs, and slipped them $10 or $20 when they were short on money. Aubin said Medley helped him deliver furniture to poor black families in the neighborhood. I thought it would be nice to see an underdog win, said Aubin, an unorthodox cop who regularly befriends troubled teenagers and young adults in an effort to turn their lives around. This guy was very violent before and he stopped being violent. He wanted a new life. Aubin says the James Medley he knew was a gregarious, childlike man whom he found endearing. He cheers you up when you are down and he gives 100% of himself when he likes you, he said. Between himself, his partner, and the Shawbridge security director, Aubin said, Medley had a support system to turn to whenever he got himself into difficult situations. Aubin recalled an incident when Medley called frantically for advice after threatening to kill a depeneur owner who got into a dispute with his girlfriend over a bill. He called me up in a panic and said, Claude, what should I do? Said Aubin, who told Medley to go back to the store, apologize to the owner for losing his cool, and offer to pay. He would react to a situation and call me for advice on how to get out, Aubin said. Sometimes I had to go and tell people, don't worry, he's not dangerous. Aubin said he also felt sorry for Medley, who was now nearly 30 and unable to read or write. He remembers that Medley once called him at the station asking to meet, but he didn't know where he was because he couldn't read the street signs. Medley described the buildings around him and Aubin told him what intersection he was at. When Aubin told him he was probably on Grand Boulevard in NDG, Medley responded excitedly, Yeah, Claude, I am on Grand. There is a big G, I guess. Less than a month after his 30th birthday, Medley's girlfriend had a baby girl, giving him a new incentive to try to deal with his illiteracy. He wanted to be able to read to his daughter. People who know Medley say he was a proud, doting father who often passed around pictures of his little girl. He was thrilled about her. She was his entire universe, said Labarge, Medley's former lawyer. He wanted to turn his life around. He had the opportunity of building a family, something he never had. To help accomplish that goal, Medley turned to staff at the Douglas Hospital. When his daughter was a toddler, Medley signed up for adult literacy classes at Angry Nun School on the hospital grounds. A former teacher said Medley still had only very basic reading and writing skills, though he was a hard-working student. But a school administrator described Medley as a manipulative, power-hungry snitch who reported his teachers for minor things, like being a few minutes late for class. You couldn't step backwards without him informing on you, said the administrator. He wanted the authority. His whole thing was to be the leader, to be the big cheese. While he was taking literacy classes, Medley and his girlfriend were also being treated by Dr. Gert Morgenstern, a Douglas psychiatrist he first met in 1982. Morgenstern asked Medley to be his assistant for an adult education class called 
called Psychiatry for the Layman, a medley led the class on an outing where he showed the students some of Montreal's rougher neighborhoods. The students were very pleased with him, Morgan Stern said. They said he was charming, intelligent, and they would like him to go further. Although he was portraying himself to the outside world as a reformed convict who wanted a new life, Medley was showing a different side within the privacy of his own home where he was using and dealing in crack cocaine. He was a user, so he didn't make that much money as a dealer, recalled a young woman who started delivering drugs to Medley's Walkley Avenue apartment shortly after he got out of jail in 1986. You'd walk in and he'd be hyper. He'd say, gimme, 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 and try to rush you. Even so, the woman said, she too believed Medley was trying to turn his life around even though he was selling crack while living with his wife and young daughter. For the first four years I knew him, when I saw him every two days, he was the perfect guy, she said. He just got out of jail. He was trying to change and get himself back together. Oben said he didn't know Medley was dealing drugs. He said he told Medley on several occasions that he would arrest him if he was committing crimes. I have a job to do and I told him that, Oban said. Armed with information about the drug trade in his neighborhood, Medley began informing MUC police officers who in 1988 had launched a highly publicized campaign to clean up Walkley. As a registered informer, Medley was paid for the information he supplied to the drug and anti-gang squads and was one of several Walkley Avenue residents who told police about drug raids. Although Medley had difficulty reading and writing, he was able to copy down the license plate numbers of suspicious cars in the neighborhood and pass them on to police. This guy knows the area. He was telling us who was who and what was happening, said a police source. He helped the cops because he wanted to be one of the boys. He wanted to get recognition. By 1991, the support system that had helped keep Medley's nose relatively clean began to crumble. Oben was dealing with internal police problems at the station and was eventually transferred out of NDG. The two men lost contact. Oben's partner drifted away and the Shaw Bridge employee who helped Medley and his girlfriend live together no longer worked in the area. With his support network dispersed, Medley immersed himself again in the criminal milieu. Medley was receiving welfare and had odd jobs as a part-time butcher and casual laborer. He unloaded leather couches and delivered bread. To supplement his income, Medley became a criminal entrepreneur, selling guns, contraband liquor, drugs, and stolen goods from the apartment he had moved to on Cote St. Luke Road near Walkley Avenue. He also rented out tapes that had been stolen from local video stores and had the cheek to charge a $3 late fee if the movies were not returned on time. Medley handed out menus listing his prices for drugs, shots of liquor, beer and videos to the crack cocaine addicts who flocked to his apartment. To collect quarters to pay for his laundry, Medley wrapped a rock of crack in silver foil, tossed it into a gumball machine and invited visitors to try their luck. There were always young people in the house, one of his victims recalled. He had us robbing schools, daycares and stealing bikes. He rewarded the teenagers who stole for him by giving them marijuana and beer and letting them stay at his house. Medley maintained his criminal network for years by using sheer street smarts to stay one step ahead of the police and violence to terrify and control anyone who dared challenge him. He had so much influence on people it was like David Koresh said a police detective comparing Medley to the cult leader who died with more than 80 followers when US authorities stormed their compound in Waco, Texas four years ago. Aubin says he thinks his departure from NDG might have contributed to Medley's embracing the criminal world more fully because he felt abandoned. With Oban gone, Medley lost the support that had kept him straight for five years. After I moved, he was alone, by himself, like an orphan, Oban said. James had no one to talk to, no one to tell him no. He needed a father figure who would tell him it was wrong. He needed a coach to say, no, James, this isn't nice. With Detective Sergeant Claude Oban's firm hand no longer guiding him, James Medley succumbed to the lure of prostitution and began pimping to make easy money. He needed prostitutes and he knew where to go to find some of society's most vulnerable girls, the youth protection system. Relying on his handsome smile, charming manner and welcoming nature, Medley presented an attractive figure to the girls, many of them runaways who hated living in group homes or detention centers. He earned their trust and the girls sought refuge at his apartment, knowing he would hide them from the police officers searching for them. Medley's typical ploy was to offer to hide the girls from the police and give them food, money, drugs, alcohol, and clothing. Some were initially attracted to the idea of hanging out with an older man and enjoying the freedom they were denied in the youth protection system. Girls being recruited were told that Medley was a nice guy who would take care of them. They looked at Medley's apartment as a place to stay, free food, free drugs,
drugs, party time, let's go, said a young offender who knew Medley and several of his victims. Police officers said Medley preyed on those girls in the system he knew to be vulnerable and didn't try to recruit from high schools because he knew he wouldn't have had a chance with stable girls. Most of Medley's targets were poorly educated girls who were under youth protection, often because of behavioral problems. They used drugs, committed petty crimes, and were estranged from their families. They have very, very low self-esteem, most of these girls, said a member of the board of directors of Batshaw Youth and Family Centers who didn't want her name used because she fears Medley. Since 1992, Batshaw has been the umbrella organization for English language social services, including youth protection on the island of Montreal. Most of them, once they get into the system, figure nobody gives a shit about them. Nobody wants to know. The parents aren't there. Whether they are or not, the girls believe they're not there. Medley knew that the girls felt abandoned and alone in the youth protection system, so he showered them with attention and became a father figure. But once the girl was trapped in his web, the party would turn sour. Medley would force the girls to repay his hospitality by stealing for him, selling drugs and prostituting in NDG or at his apartment. He beat, tortured, and assaulted some of them, forcing them to be sex slaves and to work as housekeepers and babysitters for his daughter. Between 1991 and 1996, Medley abused at least another 12 girls who were under youth protection. The abuse ranged from confining the girls against their will and beating and raping them to forcing them into prostitution and other crimes. A victim who testified at the trial said in an interview that Medley also abused more than a dozen women who were crap addicts and prostitutes. It wasn't just girls under youth protection. They were grown women too, the girl said. Medley eventually released his quarry, but not before he issued terrifying threats to kill them or their families if they told anybody what he had done. This was his way of making sure police wouldn't find young girls in his apartment. One of the first victims was a 14-year-old girl Medley raped, beat, and forced into prostitution over a two-year period ending in 1994. During two days of chilling testimony, the girl told the court Medley gained her trust while she was living in a group home. He invited her to his house to eat dinner with his girlfriend and their daughter and told her that he would help her if she ever needed it. After forcing her to make a sex video, Medley went to youth court in 1992. Natalie dressed in a suit and tie with his girlfriend and daughter in tow. He conned the judge into believing that he would be a good foster father for the girl, whose mother was a prostitute and crack addict. The judge granted Medley and his girlfriend custody of the girl for 30 days over protests from the girl's social worker. This was Medley's coup, said Dave Brown, a child care worker at one of Batshaw's units in the Laurentian town of Prevost, where several of Medley's victims lived. To get custody of this girl against the system's recommendations showed the girls how much power this guy had. During the month, Medley abused and tortured her and later forced her to work for several escort agencies as a prostitute, sometimes working for nearly 24 hours straight. Once there were seven guys from Walkley sitting in the living room and James was collecting $300 from each of them, telling them to take their turn, the girl testified. During the abuse, Medley's girlfriend was often absent from the home. She moved out in 1993, leaving him to raise their daughter, who was then five years old. Medley got the 14-year-old girl to assume some of the parenting duties for his daughter while he continued to beat, assault, and torture the teenager. Medley's abuse continued unabated for so long, partly because the girl didn't tell her story to the police until January 1994, when she ran away from Medley and was placed in Batshaw's locked protection custody unit in St. Jerome. The girl wouldn't press charges against Medley because she didn't trust the justice system. She had been molested between the ages of three and seven and her abuser wasn't jailed. The girl also believed that Medley had a privileged relationship with police officers because he was informing them about drug operations in NDG. When Medley owed drug dealers money, the girl said, he would invite police to his apartment and snitch on his creditors. I seen him sit down and talk to the police and laugh and joke and rap people out, the girl testified. Just the same, Medley was convicted in 1993 for selling drugs to an undercover cop and for assaulting the acquaintance of a brother he had met for the first time. Medley never knew his birth mother and didn't meet anyone in his immediate family until Christmas 1992. He learned that his mother was living in the Toronto suburb of Scarborough, talked to her on the telephone, and found out he had several brothers. Medley's first meeting with his brother Joseph wasn't a happy one. The day after they met in January 1993, Medley beat his brother and another man with a baseball bat because they took a 
his girlfriend and her friend to a bar and ended up staying out all night at a motel. During his trial, Medley said his brother wanted to go to a club, but Medley refused to accompany him, saying he was afraid of people in clubs. When his brother brought back his girlfriend the next day, Medley went berserk. I took a baseball bat and started hitting them, saying, you guys disrespect me, Medley testified in court in November 1993. I just freaked out. I just hit them. One of Medley's female victims said she looked on in horror, too terrified to help Medley's brother. I could hear his bones cracking and he was a big guy and he was lying on the floor bleeding and crying, asking me to help him. But what could I do? Asked the girl, who was then 15. While Medley swung the baseball bat, his friend Delroy Hunter, a leader of the Walkley Crew drug gang, pistol whipped Joseph Medley. James Medley pleaded guilty and was given a four-month jail term for his part in the assault. As Quebec court judge Louise Prévost sentenced him, she warned Medley to clean up his act. If you carry on in the same way you've been doing since since you were a juvenile and an adult, you'll get yourself into big trouble, she said. You're quite dangerous. With his first victim in protective custody, but too afraid to press charges against him, Medley brazenly continued abusing runaways with little fear of reprisal. Once he had a girl under his control, he used her to recruit other girls who later became his victims. Shortly after the 14-year-old moved to the protective custody unit in St. Jerome, Medley had another teenage girl call her. She called me from James's house telling me, James hates you. He wants to kill you, the first victim told the court. The girl who placed the call was forced into prostitution by Medley, but she was too afraid to press charges. In fact, the same girl introduced Medley to his co-accused Tracy Gonzalez in an NDG park in October 1995. Medley said his nickname was Bobby and offered to pay Gonzalez $60 to feed and clothe her if she babysat his daughter. Gonzalez, who had been under youth protection for more than two years after complaining she had been molested, stayed at Medley's for two weeks before police found her at a friend's house and took her back to the Laurentians. Between November 1995 and September 1996, Gonzalez helped Medley spot potential victims, girls she lived with in youth protection centers, and then lured them to his new apartment on Randall Avenue. She told one girl that Medley was a university student who had worked with kids at the YMCA, and another girl that Medley was a real sweetheart who would take care of her if she ran away. Having fallen in love with Medley, Gonzalez followed his orders and played an active role in the sexual assault assaults and beating of girls who were her friends. Medley told their last victim that she was sexually assaulted and beaten as a way to celebrate Gonzalez's birthday. Often, Medley had Gonzalez call girls at Batshaw's units in the Laurentians. Once the staff put her phone calls through, Medley would get on the line trying to befriend some girls and threatening others. Sometimes the phone calls were made to entice girls to run away. Medley, who used the alias Jay Adams, paid for taxis to bring the girls to Montreal from the Laurentians. Before letting the girls go, Medley ensured their silence with death threats. He made the girls believe he had a huge network of contacts who could track them down. He also told them it was futile to go to the police because the police were his friends. Some girls told officers who worked at Station 15 in NDG that Medley abused them, but police said the girls wouldn't press charges. The girls would tell me he was a bad character, but none of them would testify against him, said a police source who dealt with Medley and the girls, but spoke to the Gazette only on the condition that his name wouldn't be published. He said police suspected Medley was forcing girls into prostitution but couldn't prove it. They searched his apartment looking for homemade sex videos that Medley had allegedly made but never found them, a police officer said. It was pretty well known by the little girls that he was a big pervert, another officer said. Everyone who knew James kind of snickered and smiled and said that he is kind of weird. But Medley still managed to stay one step ahead of police who also heard stories on the street that he was hiding runaways. But to charge Medley with harboring runaways, they had to actually find the girls in his apartment. At least once, Medley spirited a runaway girl out of his apartment and sent her to Ville St. Pierre after learning a police officer was looking for her. Once the girl was gone, Medley called the officer and said, Hey, I hear you're looking for so and so. Here's where you could find her. The officer said he would follow Medley's tip and find the girl. He did this to curry favor with the police, the officer recalled. But I am not stupid. I knew he had the girls at his house and then sent them away. On another occasion, as a police officer walked down the corridor towards his apartment, Medley sent girls to the basement down a back staircase. He knew when police were on their way because he had installed a surveillance camera above his front door to monitor the corridor. The camera was hooked up to a small TV monitor beside the TV set in his living room. When a police officer warned Medley he would bust him if he ever found juveniles at his house, Medley replied, I'm not like that man. You have the wrong guy. Even while he was abusing teenage girls, Medley was trying to cook up deals with the police whenever he got into trouble. I always knew when Medley got arrested because he would call me looking to make a deal, said one police officer. So 
I would always be unavailable. Around this time, Medley occasionally bumped into his old friend, Detective Sergeant Claude Aubin. Medley was delivering meat to a restaurant on Mount Royal Avenue where Aubin ate breakfast. He'd lock the cop in a bear hug and tell him, you're not there anymore and it's not like the good old days. Medley told Aubin he wanted to talk to him and promised to call him, but he never did. If he told me about the girls, I would have said, James, come with me. You're going to talk to a police officer. You're going to face reality, Aubin said, adding that he had no idea Medley was abusing girls. All the while, Medley made sure to present himself to the outside world as a model citizen and father. He tried to be extra nice to everybody outside so he could hide his true self. One of his first victims testified in court. He was always helping neighbors, old women down the stairs, and he wouldn't let kids go without food. A former employee at his daughter's elementary school in NDG said Medley appeared to be a caring parent who wanted his daughter to do well in school. Judith Antoine, a neighbor whose daughter went to school with Medley's daughter, said she always thought of Medley as an excellent father. They hugged, held hands, and were affectionate with each other, Antoine said. She seemed to be a normal, happy, healthy girl. She was the apple of her father's eye. Antoine remembers Medley as a charming man who invited her to watch him play soccer and baseball in a local park. He was very jovial and had a great sense of humor, she said. Still, Antoine found it strange that Medley was surrounded by teenage girls. Medley would often ask her to take his daughter for the weekend and then send her over to Antoine's house, accompanied by a teenage girl. In fact, Medley's victims assumed most of the care of his daughter, cooking her meals, playing games with her, and helping her with her homework, something he couldn't do. He can't read or write. He can only count money, his first victim testified. He needed a housekeeper and a slave, and he only had people around him who he could control. He could never deal with an adult face to face. In the months leading up to his arrest in October 1996, stories began circulating in the neighborhood about Medley's bizarre relationships with teenage girls. Even other drug dealers and street thugs were repulsed by tales of what was going on inside his apartment. People knew there was some sick stuff happening, said a woman who had been collecting drug money from him, but no one was brave enough to go in there and say, hey man, what are you doing? No one wanted to pass that gate. Between November 1995 and July 1996, Gonzalez lured at least three girls to Medley's apartment where they were sexually assaulted and tortured in his bedroom. Then, at the beginning of September 1996, Medley, Gonzalez, and their co-accused Christina Sherry tricked one of the three girls, a 16-year-old, into going back to his apartment. Two months after Medley had raped her during her first visit, the trio held the girl in the Randall Apartment Avenue for 16 days, raping her, sexually assaulting her with a wooden bat, drumsticks, candles, and clothespins, and forcing her to have sex with Medley's neighbors. On September 24, 1996, police at Station 15 got a tip that the girl was at Medley's apartment. As police walked down the hallway toward the second floor apartment, Medley, Gonzalez, and Sherry watched them approach on the camera monitor. Gonzalez forced the girl into Medley's bedroom closet and told her to keep quiet. The police searched the apartment, but Medley's bedroom door was locked. They had Gonzalez open it, and Constable Eric McKay walked in, opened the closet door, and found the terrified girl cowering inside. She jumped up and hugged the police officer, saying, Thank God you found me. Please help me. The girl later told staff at the Montreal Children's Hospital that she had prayed every day to be found and had been to hell and back 100 times in three weeks. With police officers swarming in his apartment, Medley knew his number was up. One month later, after the girl was able to give police a complete statement and they had obtained statements from two other victims, police arrested Medley, Gonzalez, and Sherry. They banged down the door early in the morning to find Medley asleep on the couch with a sadomasochistic videotape playing on the TV. Gonzalez asleep in Medley's bed and Sherry asleep with Medley's daughter. A social worker accompanied police spirited Medley's daughter out of the apartment while police hid him in the bathroom so she wouldn't see her father in handcuffs. She was crying, Daddy, 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 a police officer said. In Medley's bedroom, a naked Gonzalez was trying to fight off the arresting officers, screaming at them. The next day, the three were charged with sexual assault, forcing someone into prostitution, living off the avails of prostitution, assault, drug trafficking, kidnapping, illegal confinement, uttering death threats, and weapons possession. Sherry pleaded guilty a few months later and is serving a five-year sentence at Joliet Prison. Gonzalez and Medley were found guilty Tuesday of assault, sexual assault, forcible confinement, and uttering death threats. Medley also was found guilty of kidnapping, conspiracy,
conspiracy to kidnap, sexual assault, carrying a weapon, forcing someone into prostitution, and living off its avails. The Crown Prosecutor intends to ask that Medley be declared a dangerous offender, which means he could spend the rest of his life in prison. While most of Medley's victims have found support and solace with their families, there are questions about what impact the sordid saga has had on his daughter. The girl, then eight years old, was emotionally devastated by the separation from her father when he was arrested last fall, according to a report prepared by a youth protection official in November 1996, a month after Medley's arrest. The girl said she loves her daddy very much because he is so good to her. She said Medley taught her how to ride a bike, inline skate, and swim, and was going to teach her to skate last winter. The girl was very sad when she thought about her father being in jail. After Medley was arrested, his former girlfriend called youth protection officers to inquire about the whereabouts of their daughter, who had been placed with a foster family. She told them she'd seen her daughter only sporadically over the previous three years because Medley asked her for money whenever she wanted to visit because she hadn't been supporting the child. The woman, who has two other young children, said last fall she wanted to see her daughter every week and hoped to reintegrate her into her family. The word of Medley's arrest flashed across newspaper front pages and television screens last year. People who had known him from his youth to adulthood were shocked by the degree of violence and depravity Medley had displayed. I know that he would have violent impulses that would come from frustration, said Bernard Labarge, his former lawyer, but I never thought that he would act out to that degree. It seems that he was a time bomb. Gert Morgenstern, Medley's longtime psychiatrist, said his patient was always at a high risk of getting into serious trouble. All around him there were people who were letting go, he said. They were dropping out of school and getting involved with violence and drugs. But he said he still believes Medley wanted to be a good person and has basically good values but wasn't in the right environment to express them. He had mixed feelings about some of the things he was doing, Morgenstern said. I feel very sad that he's currently discredited so badly. The arrest stunned the staff at a Jewish nursing home in Cote d'Ange where Medley had been doing maintenance work under a YMCA program that allowed people who couldn't afford to pay fines to do community work instead of going to prison. All through the month of September, while the girl was confined in his closet, Medley folded clothes, cleaned, and did odd jobs at the home where 160 Alzheimer patients live. Joe Goldberg, Medley's boss, said he presented himself as a very, very lovable individual. Everybody thought he was very nice and he did his best to work with people in different departments, Goldberg said. He felt sorry for Medley, who once came to Goldberg with tears in his eyes, saying his check was late and he and his daughter hadn't eaten in two days. I'm a very soft person, so I sent him to the restaurant here and fed him a few times. I was so beautifully sucked in, it was unreal. When the staff at the nursing home learned of Medley's arrest, they cancelled the YMCA program because they didn't want to expose their patients to other criminals. The police officer, who often warned Medley he'd bust him if he ever caught him with teenage girls, said he thought Medley finally got what he deserved. I thought that son of a bitch really got his, he said. He's a sick weirdo. I have no sympathy for that so-called piece of humanity. Even former drug dealers who knew Medley told police they were happy the cops had finally caught up with him. Some of the guys said it was about time that the police did something, said Constable Steve Niemi of the MUC Police Anti-Gang Squad. After he was arrested, Medley was taken to a holding cell at downtown Station 25 on Guy Street where his old police friend Oban was working. Oban had heard through the grapevine that an arrest was imminent but said he was still devastated when he saw Medley at the station early that morning. He had his back to me and I didn't want to see him because it was not my investigation, Oban recalled. I cried. He was just like my son. I felt like a failure. Even Oban, who saw potential in Medley, and he is very blunt about Medley's chances for rehabilitation. This guy has nothing. He has nobody. He will do it again. Here is a timeline of the James Medley story. 1958, James Medley is born. Over the next 12 years, he lives in Rosemount District with a foster family at the Douglas Hospital in Verdun and at the Weardale Orphanage in Westmount. 1970 to 1974, lives at the Shawbridge Boys Farm Center for Troubled Teenagers in the Laurentians. 1974 to 1976, attends John Grant High School in Lachine for students with learning disabilities. 1978 to 1982, sent to prison for a string of armed robberies and break-ins in the Verdun area. 1983, Medley is released from jail. 1984 to 1986, back in jail for threatening his girlfriend with an axe and more break-ins. 1986, a 16-year-old runaway from Shawbridge moves into Medley's Walkley Avenue apartment in NDG after a judge okays this arrangement. 1988, the girl has a daughter. 1992, Medley and his girlfriend go to Quebec Youth Court and get custody of a 14-year-old girl who later becomes his victim. 1993, Medley pleads guilty to assaulting his brother and a friend. He's sentenced to 
to four months in jail, but serves only 15 days. Also during the year, he's convicted of selling drugs and possessing stolen property. 1994, the girl of whom Medley has custody is put under youth protection. 1995, May, Medley is sent to jail for 45 weekends for selling drugs to an undercover cop. October, Medley meets Tracy Gonzalez. December, Medley sexually assaults a 15-year-old runaway after she goes to his apartment on Gonzalez's advice. 1996, January, Gonzalez lures a 16-year-old girl to Medley's apartment where she is beaten and sexually assaulted. July, Medley and Gonzalez beat and rape a 16-year-old girl after inviting her to Medley's apartment for a birthday party. About five weeks later, Christina Sherry, another of Medley's co-accused, lures the girl back to the apartment where she's held prisoner for 16 days. September, police find the girl in Medley's apartment and arrest the trio, who are then released. October, after finding two other victims, police re-arrest and charge Medley, Gonzalez, and Sherry with more than 30 counts of sexual assault, kidnapping, forcible confinement, and living off the avails of prostitution. December, Christina Sherry pleads guilty and is sentenced to five years in prison. 1997, Medley and Gonzalez are convicted. December, Medley sentenced to 26 years in prison. Tracy Gonzalez to seven years and eight months behind bars. Quebec court judge Gerard Girard says, it is my duty to weigh the seriousness of the crimes and to render a sentence that reflects this seriousness. I must take into account his criminal record, the premeditation, the duration of the offenses, the cruelty employed, the degradation of the young girls and their suffering. Tracy Gonzalez, 19, sat ramrod straight with her hands clasped in her lap as Girard told the court that she was not a candidate for rapid rehabilitation. He noted that her participation in the sadistic assaults was much greater than that of Christina Sherry, a second woman arrested in the case who pleaded guilty a year earlier to eight charges in relation to one victim. Authorities released Medley from prison in 2015, but ordered him to stay at a halfway house in the East End for nine years. It's an unusual position, and it was due to the fact that his sentence was so lengthy. You continue to have dark thoughts about violence and sex, a report read. Medley had no comment when he was approached by the Montreal Gazette reporter seeking his opinion on the length of time he is expected to spend in a halfway house. The Gazette also sought to ask Medley about an interview he requested with a newspaper several months earlier. At the time, he said he wanted to discuss how he was having difficulty accessing rehabilitation programs in English. He said French-speaking inmates have quicker access to such programs. Medley had reoffended in the past while out on two previous statutory releases. Medley was permitted to leave the halfway house in 2017. Gonzalez and Sherry received some notoriety in the year 2000 when they were seen in photographs with Carla Homolka inside the Joliet Institution. The three, who all participated in violent attacks on other women, had become good friends in prison. The article referenced a story that James Medley manipulated in 1976. That article was called IQ Tests Cheating Black Students by Paul de Riviere in July 1976 in the Montreal Gazette. De Riviere left the paper the next year. In the article, Medley, who's called Jimmy Medley, says, teachers repeat the same thing so many times you can go to sleep and still pick up what they say. Too much time is spent playing sports, fooling around. Many take the school as a holiday and leave it to come back when they feel like it. It definitely needs to be stricter. I was certainly put there because it was obvious I hated teachers and they did not know what to do with me. Teachers should make efforts in trying to bring children back into the regular system. Many times I reported kids who needed help and it took teachers so long to give them attention. Medley could not read or write, but later went on to manipulate columnist Jack Todd when discussing the Anthony Griffin shooting. Consider that he originally got out of prison early by offering to be a police informant, which is not a recipe for a long lifespan. And then he showed up to a cop station with guns that he pretended to have gotten off of other criminals. He had the gall to go in front of a judge and win temporary custody of a 14-year-old girl that he proceeded to rape and imprison. And Medley also leveraged his relationship with cops to protect him from arrest. This relationship clearly intimidated his victims into not complaining to police. Police officer Claude Aubin retired as a detective sergeant in 1996, but was convicted in 2001 of illegally transmitting information contained in police data banks, supposedly to criminal organizations. He wrote a book in 2003 to explain the situation. He was sentenced to two years in prison.